Okay, Jake. Can you Hi, hear me? Jake, how are you? I'm fine. Can you hear me? Yeah, can hear you fine. And uh, welcome to our community. Name of it is Face. And appreciate you being here during all these unsettling times. Um, I'm assuming you don't have anything you want to show us. So I'm going to share my screen so people could see Thank what you. you're doing now. So, Jake, uh, uh, here's Jake's Twitter handle to be able to follow him in the future. And here is uh, Jake's blog site. So, Jake, uh, you know, I read a little bit about your history and uh, you met a lot of interesting people in the financial field. So how did you end up uh, at CNBC and Fox producing these shows? Uh, was it a goal you had in mind or was it uh, possibly just, you know, something that, you know, man plans, God laughs and it happened to you? Um, a little, a little bit of that, but I think, um, I think the best example is to, best way to do this is just to go through how I got into the news business in the first place. Um, okay. You have to be honest with yourself. I think when you get into careers and ask yourself who you really are, and I knew that if I got into any other kind of job, office job, field job, whatever, I would probably get in trouble and get fired for talking about the news all the time. So <laughs> I really, uh, you, you followed your heart that I should get into the news business. But I didn't want to be someone who was uh, doing print as much because I also very much value quicker and more direct and clearer communication. So television was something that I was very interested in. And I found out that Northwestern's graduate program in broadcast was only a year and was extremely hands-on, very little classroom work. They immediately sent you out into the field. And in fact, the last few months, you're a DC correspondent for a lower budget local news station. So it's a, it's a tremendous experience. It's still pretty much the same for if anyone listening has a child or a friend who might want to get into the business. It's, I, I really recommend hands-on. And further than that, I started by doing local news in small markets. I was the producer of the ABC station in Bangor, Maine. Then I went to Decatur, Illinois. Then I went to Cleveland. And then I came back to New York where I had spent my Kind of like a stand-up comic uh, bounces, so what bounces I learned around. From local news, is that there was tremendous lack, and general news, there was a tremendous lack of expertise. The people who you see on everything from your local news station all the way up to the major news anchors of the major networks, if they're doing general news, unlike the panelists you just had on and things like that, they, their level of expertise is extremely low. And that is not to say that they are not intelligent people. It takes a certain level of intelligence to communicate well. But Did you, you want to be behind the camera? Night, or even after a few weeks, you switch and change. Your, 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 your potential for expertise is low. You, you kind of move from one thing to the next. And then you have the celebrity factor, especially at the network level, which I think also melts brains, if you know what I mean. So, Can you hear me? I very much became interested in finding people within the journalism and television journal journalism who were experts in something. And there's really only two places for that. That's financial news and sports news. In both of those fields, People cannot go on the air without having really good basic knowledge of, of what they're doing. And of course, CNBC is a great place for that. A lot of the people who are on CNBC, where I used to work full time, I'm, I'm still their editorial columnist contributor, but our, our former traders, people who used to work at a, at, at a trading desk, people okay. who used to work at some level of, of, of a major corporate hierarchy. And I think that is important. So that's how I became attracted to it. I wasn't one of those people who started trading in high school or did things like that. I was always interested in the markets and I followed market news from a very young age, but I was never one of those people who wanted to do that full time. But when I looked for people who knew something about what they were talking about and I wanted to work with people like that, I only had two choices and sports is too much of a fun hobby for me. I never wanted to make that work. So financial news became where I became focused in, after about six years of local news, I, I started doing that and I've been doing it for 20. Okay, uh, can you hear me, Pete? Jake, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, because I was trying to talk uh, oh, sorry. and make it a conversation. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry oh, about that. Oh, okay. Um, so did you want to be behind the camera or in front of the camera? Well, in the beginning, I didn't want to be in front of the camera uh, because, Why? like I said, I was in the local news position where I didn't really think that the on-camera folks – had much control over what was coming on, on the program. They were just kind of reading a teleprompter. So, but when I started getting more involved in, in financial news, I realized that I had more of a contributor 
type role there. I don't know if I could be an anchor of a big show on prime time, even on CNBC or Fox Business, but I do now a lot of on air contributing at a lot of networks. And of course, I have my, my regular columns at my online content. Okay, so why don't we get to the topic at hand? I'm not, you know, I know you're not a epidemiologist, but uh, you had an opinion on what we should do with this corona uh, crisis that we have, the virus being a crisis here behind the curve. Uh, you think that we need a timeout. So uh, it looks like we're having a timeout forced upon us uh, anyway. So do you think that we reacted too slowly to this here in America? Well, I think that we spent too much time, and I can tell you this from the newsroom. So here, here I am, your inside man, and what the newsroom is talking okay. about. That's why uh, I brought you on. Right at the beginning of the year. Okay. So I'm not going to pretend I was the first person to raise the alarm about coronavirus, but in my newsroom, I pretty much was, and I was pretty much shouted down yeah. by people who I know what to that's me. like. And then the focus only became on, oh, how is, our, how is the coronavirus going to affect our supply chain, chain from China? And that was pretty much the only focus. There was not a lot of discussion of what if this epidemic hits the United States and we start seeing a lot of illnesses here and maybe even death. That's, by the way, Dale, that's new. I mean, we've only heard that narrative in the news media for a couple of weeks now. Yeah, so, conventional media, but, you know, if you were digging yeah, uh, with, you know, now the, all the different social platforms that we have, uh, there have been a lot of people on top of this that have been really ringing the alarm bell quite loudly for a while. So, you know, to, I guess, you know, uh, John Q. Public, it's news, but a lot of people knew this was uh, developing well before that. And let me ask you this, are people that your contacts and your network of people that you do your intelligence gathering believe that this could have happened to the markets anyway, and that the coronavirus was just the match that lit the fuse, or are they saying it's a you know almost 100 percent? This is all Corona. Yeah, they're, they're saying this is all black swan event Corona stuff, um, and they might be wrong. You know, clearly when you have these kinds of events, it exposes all the ugliness and all the flaws in the markets overall and in the yeah. economy overall. But the people I've spoken to have been week after week before this hit surprised and making sure that they talked about it at least again on social media about some of the strengths in the economy here in the u.s that they had not expected um some of the economists i speak to there's not a lot of them who are willing to admit that the trade war with china which they immediately which they originally thought would be a total disaster a lot of them are now willing to say and not, i'm sorry not a lot of them only one or two of them that i know are now willing to say hey we were wrong about that it wasn't what we expected and so that is a big pipeline for me. So yeah, they're focusing on Corona only. Although, listen, I don't discount the inherent weaknesses that we had in the economy that we were ignoring even before coronavirus. But I will say, it's, I, I don't think it's fair to, to focus too much on that. We're clearly all in an all hands on deck situation with this. Although I will acknowledge that when we get past it, we certainly won't be problem free in the economy that, that, that yeah. oh, okay when do you do you uh, when do you believe we'll get past this from your sources well that is interesting because the answer to that question is actually not an economic or sadly it may not even be a scientific an uh, answer to your question i think that there's going to be a political answer to the question here's why i say that no matter how serious the spread is if we don't see widespread death, and I certainly hope we don't, I hope we don't see anything along the lines of the percentage of deaths that we're seeing in Italy, for example, or Iran. If we don't see that, Dale, I cannot politically, th I, I don't think that there's going to be a political platform or any political strength for our leaders in this country to continue to virtually shut down the economy and keep people in their homes. People are going to re revolt against this if they don't see widespread death, which of course we don't want to have happen. So to me, I think we're dealing with probably the month of May. We, I mean, it's going to get really, really difficult to impose this kind of shutdown on our economy and quarantines and everything else like that for another five, six, longer than another five or six weeks. It's going to be untenable, no matter how much stimulus or bailouts or whatever the federal government brings. I'm just talking about from a political and a cultural standpoint, which if you really study our economy, you can't ignore those factors. So I don't think we're going to be able to get into the month of May 
like this, even if the spread continues. The only, again, the only way that continues is if, we, God forbid, we see widespread debt, then of course people will stay in and they won't, they won't revolt. But if, if we don't see thousands of deaths, which again, we're all hoping we don't see, I can't see this going past the, you know, into the month of May. Okay, and uh, going past the month of May, uh, with this going on, you know, we have an election coming up here, Jake. I'm interested in what your thoughts are. Uh, for example, if, uh, say, for example, they dampen down, uh, we have a little reprieve, kind of like what happened 100 years ago. The first year of the Spanish flu was bad enough to stop World War One. People were too sick to kill each other. But they came out on Armistice Day and thought we had an all clear. And it was really the second wave of the Spanish flu that was much more devastating. So, I mean, are you hearing that this could be a reality that's with us, that, uh, you know, it's going to cycle it's, and reemerge? I know a lot of people are worried about now that China's numbers are coming down and they're sending people back out to work, that there could be a reemergence of this virus in China. Yeah, it's one of the many fears, and that's one of the reasons why I, in my previous answer, I pointed out this, this stir-crazy factor. I mean, we might be able to get, we might get even better evidence or more solid evidence that there could be a resurgence of this, and yet until people see it, they're not going to comply for much longer. I, I just cannot see the, the, the people of this country with their kids at home, I mean, that is a major factor that enough people aren't talking about. Um, I don't see them complying, and then that's a huge danger. This is something for the public health officials that they're going to have to tackle and deal with. Now, you know, what they tried in Britain. They tried to say, like, look, let's just quarantine the elderly population of people who have emphysema or other respiratory problems and see if that works. And that didn't work, and it wasn't because of the public health problems with that. It didn't work because politically it didn't work. With news every day of higher and higher infections, there was no way the political leaders could continue that policy. And I think that you know, to me, this is these are all this is where politics and public health and science all kind of converge and, and start to fight each other. Um, and your, your 1919 example is a good example of that. Um, my grandfather almost died from that in 1919. By the way, they thought he they thought he was a goner. So mm. I, I am I am a bit of a strong opinion here that if you're an investor, you're looking at these markets and you're not considering the political ramifications of any policy, no matter how sane it may seem from an economic or public health point of view, you're, 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 you're going in a little bit blind. You have to realize that no matter how popular or unpopular a president is, or your governor is, or, or your local leaders are, their ability to maintain a shutdown or a quarantine, even with the best of scientific evidence, will be, continues to erode day by day. Okay, uh, because uh, even uh, in Italy, uh, it's one thing to have a lockdown and, for example, what's going on in San Francisco, you know, stay at home. Uh, there's still a lot of people that are going out. In fact, there are a lot of, uh, there are examples of people that uh, have tested positive in Europe that still go out. And, you know, it takes actually uh, police or National Guard to enforce something like that. Do you think we could end up having National Guard. And you know what I'm most concerned about is uh, how do we have a national election, which is only about, you know, six months away, five months away. Uh, under these circumstances, uh, for example, it was in Ohio that they postponed the primary. Uh, do you think that there's going to be a problem with having an election? And could it be a problem with the president who, when things don't work, says it's rigged and it's a hoax and, you know, uh, the legitimacy of this election would be easier to call into question because of, say, for example, people being afraid to go wait in line at the polls this fall. Yeah, it's, it's going to hit that critical mass well before election day. You know, November is... You know, a lifetime over, away. It's a yeah, lifetime away now, isn't it? Seven plus months away. We're eight. Well, we're pretty much you know, almost eight months away. A little less than eight months away from election. We're going to hit critical mass on things. I mean, if, if there's any way to couch it, that's actually some good news, right? Because the fact is, if we were all under a compliant shutdown and everyone was quarantining, and then suddenly the election came around and then we had this huge deadline, 
that and that would be the first test. That would be a really rough first test. But like I said, I think the first test is going to come within a few weeks when the nation starts to revolt against an economy that shut down and being forced to stay at home and not be able to go out and their kids home from school. But so that is a scenario that I think if there's any silver lining, I don't think we're going to get all the way to November before this is test for the fact that people start going out and, and saying, hey, I'm not going to, I'm not going to keep staying in a quarantine here. I show no symptoms and hardly anyone is dying from this. So if there's any so the, silver lining. So the mortality rate's going to be the key to this whole thing over the next month. Yeah, I, I really think so. And, and not only the mortality rate, but who is dying? Now, you know, there's been a lot written in the last couple of days about how callous some people have been sounding about our elderly population. People saying, well, if it's only the elderly, I don't care. It's yeah, it's enough. only, only. Yeah. I know, that's, that's a sick, that's a sick uh, sentiment, and I don't want to hear that. But the truth is, if young people start dying in a bigger number than they currently are, that is going to have a much bigger political impact, right? I mean, yeah, because they, I, and I they have a lifetime of tax pain ahead of them, <laughs> where the elderly are only, you know, just uh, living off the system. That's the way That's the right. millennials look at it, right? That's the way they look at it. And um, look, elderly Americans, from a statistical point of view, are statistically the wealthiest people in the world. That doesn't, <laughs> doesn't mean elderly people are all rich. It's just that there's a tremendous amount of wealth concentrated there. So that's another reason for some of the resentment. You know, the, there's a difference between jealousy and resentment. I've written about it. Jealousy is actually a good thing. It can really motivate people to do things, to want to try to be like a person who has the things that they would like to have. Resentment, though, is a different thing. Resentment doesn't breed as much action. Resentment just breeds resentment. I, I think that Bernie Sanders is a great example of that. He really stokes resentment. And then you see the proof is in the pudding. Did people actually come out and do something and vote for the man? No. These young people who really are the basis of Bernie Sanders' campaign, who I think are a lot of the same people who may be callous towards the elderly right now, even though they're supporting an elderly guy in Bernie, haven't shown up bail at the polls in these primaries. It's incredibly interesting. Why? Why? You know? Why haven't they? Well, the biggest, the easiest answer to that question is that they never do. You know, the exception okay. proves All the right. rule. There was a big turnout of young voters in 2008 for Barack Obama. And since then, it's gone right back down to the levels that we usually see. Only about a quarter of 18 to 25-year-olds ever actually vote. That's usually the number. It, like I said, it spiked in 2008 for Barack Obama, and then it's gone right back down. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I think the, re the biggest reason is what you were talking about. Young people don't see their role in – they, they don't have a – they don't have a – maybe they don't have as much – they don't have a business. They don't have, they're, made, they're less likely to have a job. So when they go and vote and they see, or they see a result of an election, they don't see it making much of a difference to them one way or the other, which is the reason why all non, people who are all, all alienated voters don't vote. Uh, voter alienation, when you stretch it beyond just young people, you, you know, the answer they'll usually give is, oh, it, it, there's no difference in, in my life whether I voted or not. These people are going to screw me one way or the other or they're not, and that's it. For years, they taught us in school that it was voter apathy, that no one was paying attention. And I always thought they were discounting and lowballing the number of actually alienated voters. And I think there's some alienation among young people in addition to that apathy. And that's the biggest reason. Interesting. Yeah. So, you know, even baby boomers have had uh, that experience of, you know, watching, you know, uh, people don't realize it, but there are baby boomers. The Great Recession wasn't so great, too and never recovered yeah. and feel that type of alienation as well. So maybe it's uh, resentment is the strongest emotion in our country right now. But what you're saying um, is that people want a healer and a peacemaker, and that's the way they see Joe Biden. Well, that's the big, I mean, that's another thing that you have to always remember. And one of the things that was very humbling for me I went into 2016, like so many other people, thinking that, oh, Donald Trump doesn't have a chance, and just kind of a ridiculous candidacy. And then in March, it just hit me that the man was going to win. And it took me a little while to publish that column for CNBC, but I did. Um, I wrote it in May. We published it, I guess, on the last day of May, saying that Trump was going to win. And then from May until November, uh, my bosses kept asking me, do you want to revisit that? Do you want to say he's not going to win? And so, I, in other words, I had to write that column about six times because every time something was that bad, it would presumably happened to Trump's campaign, I would have to write a, a new column saying, no, I still think he's going to win. 
And what was humbling about it was that I still thought, like a lot of people, that campaigns were about ideas, yeah. and that me, even if there was a candidate who was a little bit shallow, if he or she had the right sloganeering and maybe was on the right side of a particular issue, then they would win. But what I realized You now, know, Jake, Jake, it's very interesting, you know, with your background and shows you produced. Actually, someone you produced a show for, Larry Kudlow, who I interviewed during the 2016 um, uh, primaries, I asked Larry uh, if he thought Donald Trump had a chance to win the nomination, and he said no, and I, I really don't agree with uh, many of his policies. Now look. Yeah. So, okay, so that... You know, I, mean, I was working on a show with him, and he decided, you know, he ended up yeah. going to the White House. Uh, so, you know, I could do this for you. <laughs> I made him feel at home. Booyah! Yeah. Okay, you know, so... Go ahead, Jay. Yeah, I mean, he, he had a change of... I mean, even the day, the day before the election, he wasn't sure he was going to win. And yeah. I was just convinced from, from March on. Um, and that doesn't make me a prophet. There were people who okay. had it. Well, I'm going to well give you a chance... I, I'm going to give you a chance to be Nostra Novak. <laughs> who's, go, who's going to win this fall? Well, obviously the coronavirus has thrown a tremendous wrench into everything. But what I am not seeing from people who think, oh, Joe Biden will clearly take, you know, be, be, the, be the winner in all of this because of the, the fact that we're probably going into a deep recession, at least for a short period, we're probably going to see a tremendous anger about coronavirus, whether it's President Trump's fault or not. But again, that's the humbling aspect of it. Remember that people still vote for the most persuasive candidate. And I am not at all convinced that the voting public in this country, or even the Democratic voters, are actually have any confidence or really are connected to Joe Biden. The only reason why he's winning in the primaries now is that the, the, the Democratic Party establishment cleared out his most yeah. serious competition. They did a very good job of frightening any of the potential older voters who might vote for, for Bernie Sanders. And both Joe Biden has never proven on his own outside the tiny state of Delaware that he can convince a critical mass of voters to go with him. He, he turns people off the more you see it, which is why they're trying to keep him under wraps. It's something I advise them to do. I, I don't do any advice because I root for any candidates. I just like to do campaign analysis, and I wrote a column about that a few weeks ago about how Biden wants to hold on to this nomination. He had to go into relative hiding. So honestly, yes. as the country gets more and more worried and frightened and angry about the coronavirus, I don't know if Joe Biden is going to be the recipient of the, um, of the benefits of this, which might lead to the Democrats rejiggering again and going with somebody else, not going to be burned. So the answer okay. is, I'm not even sure we even have all of our candidates in place right now, and we are in this coronavirus shutdown. But gun to my head, I still think that President Trump has a tremendous advantage here because of this. This is the reason. Because if he continues along the messaging that he's had for the last couple of days and starts to get a little bit more of a leadership role, there will be some people who say, like, look, we don't have any choice. You know, George W. Bush was not a popular candidate among the public in general, but he had the blessing of running against Al Gore, who was completely unpersuasive and boring, and a John Kerry, who was unpersuasive and unlikable. And Donald Trump may be a similar recipient of that. So right now, because he has the chance to be a more persuasive and more leadership and, 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 and project more leadership in this crisis, I think that he has still, it's, his, it's still his salute. It's still President Trump it still has the best chance to win. Because I don't think Joe Biden, even the, under the worst of circumstances, can engender confidence. Okay. Okay. Interesting call. Why don't we wrap it with uh, an area of the world that you have great interest in, and, and that's Israel. So with what's happening here, um, there has been some escalation and some missiles and people moving around uh, our military in Iraq. Uh, do you have some concerns that while everyone's attention is diverted to the coronavirus, that um, you know bad actors will make moves when people are, or nations are in weaker positions and when they're in stronger? Well, here's my biggest concern, and it comes from what I think is generally a positive development. Right, you, you, you had two major funders of, of terrorism and military action against Israel over the last 40 years, and that was Iran and Saudi Arabia. 
Now, for the last three, four years, Saudi Arabia's window has been closed to funding of terrorism against Israel. They closed right. that window for a number of reasons. The biggest Mainly reason oil. is that they're more worried about Iran and they want that partnership with Israel, okay. the de facto partnership with Israel to continue. Now, if that left Iran, which was a good and bad news story, Iran, you know, that's one less funder. So it was only Iran now funding, and that was great. The problem is that Iran is much more belligerent than Saudi Arabia ever was, even in its four states. Even when Saudi Arabia was its most belligerent towards Israel, it was never anything like the way Iran is. Now, Iran is very much on its back right now, that not only from coronavirus, but the killing of Soleimani by the United States, which was a, trip, was a very, very positive move for the whole world was very positive for Israel as well, because Soleimani made it his life's work to continue a lot of mayhem all over the world, especially against Israel. Now, of course, they're hit with the coronavirus. But, you know, I've been doing this long enough to know that whenever there's a vacuum, someone is going to fill it. So I am worried about who is going to fill this vacuum if Iran continues to, to deteriorate their situation, deteriorate both financially and health-wise. Will it be ISIS? Will it be another? Will, will another terrorist group come into the, the fray here? And that's even worse than Iran. That is a big concern right now. But what is good is that I think right now, Israel right now is handling the coronavirus. And again, economically, it's going to be a disaster for them just, just as much as anyone else, if not worse. But from a health, well, they, public they locked health down the country, didn't they? Lock down the yeah, country. I mean, they're, they're, they're getting close to that. They have not yet said everyone has to stay home, but they're getting. Okay. But there's a the Nobel laureate Michael Levitt, who's been really studying this very, very closely, just predicted this morning that Israel will only have 10 deaths from the coronavirus. Now, even God forbid if he's off by a factor of 10, we're talking about what 100 deaths. So, so it's not that that to me is, is, is a good sign. Remember, Israel has a very large elderly population, and there's a lot of close con congregating both in the army and in some of their yeshivas and their religious you know, academies. So the chances of this spreading to an elderly population are, are pretty large, but at the same time, there's a lot of vigilance there. So, but economically, this is a disaster because Israel's tourism industry, which has always been a vital industry, has become even more vital because it's been growing like crazy. Over the last five, six years, Israel's tourist numbers have been exploding. And guess where most of that explosion has been coming from? Asia. They've been getting a tremendous amount of Asian visitors. It's surprising because these are not Christian and not Jewish visitors who tend, who tend to come to Israel. So from an economic standpoint, I think this is a disaster. From a health, public health standpoint, Israel may be a beacon of light to others. Let's hope one leads to, that leads to a, a, a turnaround for the economy at some point. Uh, you know, I just want to ask you one more question. Tell me what you think, Jake. You know, every time I look at this coronavirus sure. map and all the red dots and blotches all over the globe, how come I don't see any red dots in Russia? <laughs> I think the answer is... Two pull. One is they're probably not telling the truth and not really telling us about it. But also it just goes to show how not mobile that population is. Um, they don't have that kind of social interaction. They don't have that kind of tourism that other countries deal with. Uh, you know, for years we've been saying that Russia's economy is about the size of Italy and it's a one trip pony with oil. And I think we're learning that. I mean, the, the, this, is the, the, this is why these anti, yeah, listen, I, I think that globalism has its pros and cons. I'm not 100% in favor of it. I'm not 100% against it. But Russia is a good example of how globalism uh, is, is not really happening everywhere, right? Russia doesn't have a real, I mean, they're, they're politically a globalist country. They're, they have their dance at every wedding all over the world. They try to play off different political uh, uh, disputes everywhere and they cause problems everywhere. This is not just the, they don't just, by the way, they don't just meddle in the U.S. elections, although I don't think their meddling had much of an effect, but they meddle everywhere and they always yeah. have it. They did it during, under, under the, the time of the czars too, this free day the U.S. czar. But to me, this just goes to show how isolated the people in the country is, how, how economically non-diversified that country is. And, you know, they've gone from the czar to the USSR to Putin. They have yet to have decent economic leadership in that country since ancient times. And it's such a shame. You know what's great about you, Jake? I can ask you anything. <laughs> I hope so. So <laughs> it really was a pleasure meeting you and, and getting your views. And, you know, uh, I'd like to do this again with you as things unfold here in America, and it was really a pleasure meeting you. Thank you for your time today, Jake. Thank you. Hopefully next time under better circumstances.
All right, buddy. So everyone, that's Jake Novak, and you can follow his writings and what he's thinking at jakenovaknews.com and on Twitter. And everyone, stay healthy. Remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings, and we'll see everyone tomorrow. Thanks again, Jake Novak.